I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby here with James Spinney and Peter Middleton, the directors of a new documentary, The Real Charlie Chaplin. And, um, and Peter, I want to start with you just in terms of one of the things that is always interesting to me is the titles of films. And at what point during the process of this did you decide to actually call it The Real Charlie Chaplin? Oh, thank you so much for having us, Tony. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 a very good question. We we've been working on this project, I think, since 2017. So it's been through many iterations, and I think we'd always sort of struggled to to find a a kind of a title that summed up Chaplin. He had this extraordinary kind of canvas of a life, and and such a sort of enigmatic character. We were we were completely thrown for a long time about about finding a title that can encapsulate that life story. And um, in the end, we sort of went for yeah, the real Charlie Chaplin, which we kind of put down almost as a sort of provocation of of, of sorts. Really, we sort of we start the film actually with a with a quote from a friend of from a friend of his, which which uh, says to enjoy any Charlie Chaplin, you have the good fortune to encounter but don't try and link them up to anything uh, you can grasp there are, there are too many of them and the film kind of then takes this tumble into trying to kind of search for for versions of Chaplin and through different accounts and, and mythologies and 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 so we wanted a, a title that could slightly kind of hint towards that prod at that that is a little bit kind of mischievous and um, and a little bit of a wink to the audience I suppose. So in in that you know, Chaplin is such a, in many ways, you know, there's the, there's the, there is the mythology of Chaplin. And so when you're taking on a subject that has that much history, um, where do you even begin? I, I, I would imagine that the process of research is, is just like climbing a mountain. Where, James, where do you begin with that? Yeah, well, that's, that was entirely our experience, Tony. We very much felt that we had a mountain in front of us when we began the film. Um, you know, it's been said that there are over 800 books written about Chaplin in dozens of languages. Um, and there's lots of wonderful films and documentaries that have been made about his life. Um, so there's an awful lot for us to dive into. I mean, and we feel very lucky to have had the chance to kind of to kind of dive into this rich and fascinating world of his, of his life and work. Um, but at the same time, there was always this question hanging over us of, you know, has everything already been said? Is there anything new to find? Um, and so we began looking for materials that we thought could shine a new light on his life and on his character. Um, and we came across a few very enticing leads along the way. Um, the first was um, an audio interview that was done with Chaplin in the, in the 1960s by a Life magazine reporter called Richard Merriman. Um, now Chaplin hated interviews and, um, and he, he was very reluctant across his life to, to do any interviews of, of an extended length. But for three days, he sat down with this reporter from Life magazine in the 1960s in his home in Switzerland, where he was living at that time. Um, and he spoke on tape um, for hours and hours. Um, and I think documentary makers have been reluctant to use it for a long time because the audio quality was quite poor, but fortunately with new digital techniques, we were able to sort of salvage the, uh, the signal from the noise um, and, and hear Chaplin's voice. You know, this icon of silent cinema was sort of speaking to us from, uh, from across the decades. Um, so that felt like a, a real starting point, you know, he hearing Chaplin telling his own story in his own words. Um, and then on top of that, we came across um, a transcript for an, for an interview with his childhood friend, Effie Wisdom. Now Chaplin um, grew up in a very, from a very humble background in, in South London, not far from where Pete and I are sitting actually. Um, he was in the workhouse. Um, his mother was put into the asylum when he was very young. His father died of alcoholism when Charlie was just 13 years old. So, um, so we, we were looking for ways to, to have an insight into this childhood because, you know, there's so few photographs of him when he was young um, and so few accounts of people because it was in the 1890s, it was so long ago. Um, but in the 1980s, um, the film historian Kevin Brownlow had managed to track down his childhood friend Effie Wisdom and recorded this wonderful interview with her where she speaks in this really um, glorious Cockney accent, the same voice that Chaplin would have spoke with when he was a boy. Um, and we felt transported into his childhood and into um, into that world of South London in the 1890s, which which Chaplin later would would restage in his Hollywood studio um, and the scenes of his childhood he revisited as the Tramp. Um, so having that insight um, was 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 felt so important to us. And then the final piece um, for us, which we which we felt was would be crucial to uh, to this film, was a recording from 1947 um, of a press conference for his film Monsieur Verdu. Um, which was his first film without his beloved Tramp character. Um, and the, this press conference has become kind of legendary in, um, in Chaplin lore um, because um, 
no one asks any questions really about the film. Almost all the questions are about Chaplin's supposed communist leanings um, and this like this sense that he'd stopped being a good comedian since he was um, making political statements in his work. Um, now, only a fragment of that interview, um, sorry, that press conference was 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 thought to have survived um, and have been archived. But our, our researchers managed to track it down in um, in, a, in a garage in San Francisco. Um, and so we found the recording and we were transported um, into that place where, you know, you see the, the political and media establishment of Hollywood kind of turning against Chaplin. And so with those three kind of openings into the mountain, uh, those three kind of um, little cracks in this huge edifice, we sort of thought that those would be ways into the subjects. Um, and, um, and those became really important sort of testimonies for us. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up that, that press conference because as I was watching the film, there are moments in that press conference where you could almost imagine those types of questions being asked to, you know, to Hollywood people today uh, when there's discussions of politics and the overlap between politics and, and entertainment. Um, did, did that same connection kind of resonate with you guys when, when you first came across it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. There's, there's, there's very, it's very easy to draw that 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 distinction. Those kind of contemporary contemporary resonances are, are very much there in that moment of Chaplin's life. You know, this was this was very, this was only six years after the kind of dizzying triumph of the Great Dictator, where where Chaplin has kind of stood up. Um, stood up for uh, for put, well, laid his his trump character on the altar as, as as we say in the film and stood up against hitler and and made this um very very impressive political statement of course that film ends with with that speech that was it seven minutes long speech where he's sort of pleading for 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 unity and to stand up against um, the 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 tyranny of authoritarianism um, and then to just see how and to understand how the, the the tables are turned and how the political establishment and the media establishment um, are turned against him in those intervening years in the in the lead up to his his first film without his tramp character, um, and the way that you know in the sort of febrile um, atmosphere of, of of the Red Scare uh, in, in in the United States in the 1940s, um, th those those same institutions that that, that had, had had held him up as a um, as as their golden boy quickly kind of turned on him and the tenor of those those questions that you identify there you know just standing up and completely uh savaging him and and, and really really not wanting to talk at all about his kind of his creative work his his, his new film but instead just 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 um, trying to tear him down for his own personal beliefs and his political beliefs, um, and the way that they they are uh, they are very kind of very much sort of uh, simplified, I suppose. You know, there's there's a, the, one of our favourite moments is is where there's a there's a there's a journalist who um, who's from from actually from the American Legion, so a very kind of uh, right wing group there. Uh, is, is, is lambasting Chaplin for his perceived lack of patriotism, and he sort of stumbles midway through his speech, and 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 and, and says that he sort of he read this in a source that he hadn't fought in the second in the first World War, so going back you know thirty years there, and it just felt very much like it was it was layers of kind of conjecture and accusation, and people just opportunistically looking to looking to tear him down. And when we found that that recording, it was um, it was a remarkable discovery for us. James mentioned. We found it in a, in a garage in San Francisco. And just to hear the whole thing, it plays out actually for about 45 minutes, although we only use four or five minutes in the film. It does have a real, really, real, a real uh, savage tone to it. And there is a, it does, it does, send, it does send a shiver down your spine. Yeah, the, I, read, I read it in a source is like, you know, that era's version of, well, I saw this on the internet. Exactly that, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, in 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 tackling this, you know, you're you're again the 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 big issue in tackling a subject like Chaplin, especially in this documentary, is because we you kind of look at him through the lenses of Chaplin, the filmmaker, Chaplin, the family man, uh, and Chaplin, who was a really kind of in many ways, I think, a damaged uh, individual. Um, were any of those aspects of Chaplin? Did one aspect? provide a particular challenge versus the others? Yes, that's such an interesting question. Um, I mean, Chaplin 
as you allude to, um, in many ways is quite an elusive character. It seems like the people who knew him best said that he had a kind of chameleonic um, aspect, that he would often reflect back to people, whoever they wanted him to be, that he that he was always acting, he was always performing, always on show. Those are the words of Virginia Sherrill, who was in his film City Lights. So there's this sense that he's quite hard to reach, even through the voices of um, the people who knew him best. Um, but And we were very keen to sort of see how... Um, how he, uh, whether we could find him in these different spaces that he that he was, because of course, as we've alluded to, Chaplin went from this humble upbringing to being one of the most famous people in the world. You know, for a long time he was considered the most famous person in the world, famous in a way that that no one really had been before, because that type of fame wasn't really possible um, before the mass media and technology of film came along, which was cheap and which everyone had access to. So all across the world, people um, hadn't had a sense of identifying with Charlie Chaplin or, or the Tramp. Um, and, um, and this kind of gulf between the sense of intimacy that he created with audiences, this sense that people knew and loved him and, and fell in love with him on screen. Um, and then this sense that as a, as a person, he was very hard to access was really interesting to us. And, and as you say, that meant exploring um, how he was as a, as a director, because, you know, he directed, produced, edited, scored and starred in all his films. So, um, you know, how his creative process was so wrapped up in, um, in his own personality, how he was sort of journeying inwards through his work. You know, his films are always exploring the, uh, the traumas and humiliations of his childhood. He's always going back to, to those London streets that he'd sort of escaped. Um, but also, as you say, kind of exploring him, um, him as, a, as, a, as a husband, um, as a father, um, as a friend. Um, even though at times, as we say, we found him quite hard to reach and, um, and this sense of the real Charlie Chaplin, you know, the, the, the more we looked, the more versions we kind of, we kept finding. One of the, one of my, actually my favorite parts of, of the film are the way that you kind of intersperse these kind of reenactments of certain moments, um, you know, with, uh, with his childhood friend or, you know, kind of recreating the atmosphere of the Life magazine interview. Um, what what was the de decision making process behind that? Yeah, well, um, that's a really interesting question. We um, we spent a long time um, think ex exploring with different structures for the film, looking at different ways that we could we could kind of piece together the material. And it's such a, a challenge when you're dealing with a life story. You know, um, I think biopics often struggle to tell um, the stories of lies and often have to find very um, inventive ways to kind of structure it because a human life is quite hard to map on to, to a two hour time frame. Um, but particularly I think with Chaplin's life, which is one of you know, the great rags to riches stories and, and which kind of seems to cover so much of the 20th century and take on kind of modernity, you know, the arrival of new technologies, the first and second world war. Um, and so, and also, of course, this extraordinary body of work that Chaplin made, you know, there have been whole films made about just a single one of Chaplin's films or, or a year in his life. And so we were trying to make a film that, that could sort of, I think, encompass lots of those different aspects and, and would hopefully be an introduction to people who don't know his work at all, as well as offering something for people who are, who are you know, huge fans. We wanted to make a film that would be appeal to all those audiences. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've talked about how there have been these other great films made about his life. And I think we were conscious that, um, that if you assemble all the material in a sensible order, that the film kind of creates itself. And we were, we were keen to sort of, I think, um, to, to kind of um, move against that and to try and look for different structures and, and different ways in. Um, and those three um, recordings that we talked about, the, the Life magazine one and the F.E. Wisdom recording and, and this 1947 press conference, those felt like they, they could offer us sort of present tenses, I think, and in this huge sort of swirling story, you know, we're covering Chaplin's whole life, which is, which is 88 years. And, um, and I think we were looking for times when we could pause and rest and be in a kind of, be in a room. Um, and the idea of kind of settling in, in Chaplin's home in Switzerland, where he lived for the last well, 20 odd years of his life, um, seemed really appealing to us. And, um, and um, that Life magazine interview that, that we talk about, um, uh, as well as Richard Merriman, the, um, the journalist, there was also um, a photographer, Roddy McDowell, who's the actor Roddy McDowell was there as well, snapping away throughout the interview. There are hundreds of, um, of glorious pictures of Chaplin um, telling the story. 
So we were listening to the recordings and, um, and looking at the photos of Chaplin, and we were kind of transported into that space, into that living room. Um, so we wanted to try and um, find a way to creatively, you know, take the audience with us into that kind of imaginative leap into his, into his living room. Um, and that, that, that kind of became the starting point for these recreations, these restagings. Um, and so our actors lip synced along to the original audio recordings. And then we intercut those restagings that we filmed with the photographs. Um, and um, it creates this sort of sense of, of being there with Chaplin as he tells his story, I think. Um, and it was appealing to us because there's so much material in the film. There's all of Chaplin's wonderful, um, wonderful cinematic works. There's archive of him, there's photographs, there's headlines. Um, and so these, these were kind of little moments of pause and respite within that kind of kaleidoscopic swirl. I, I found it as I was, as the film ends, I, I almost had this kind of like haunting feeling of, would a person like Chaplin, with his talents, but also with his faults, um, would he even be viable in the 21st century? Or was he truly like, did he exist at literally like the perfect time uh, to have his success, but also have the demons that he had? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a good question and one that we've um, talked about quite a bit ourselves and, and tried to figure out. I mean, I think that there is a there is a certain sense that, you know, Chaplin, Chaplin came to um, uh, came to the sort of the height of his fame and, 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 and that height was e extraordinary and, and, and unlike anything that had seen before because of that kind of confluence, I suppose, of uh, of technology and talent, but the, but the nineteen you know the mid nineteen teens um, cinema was able to travel in a way that 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 hadn't been possible and images and and uh, was were, was able to travel in a way that hadn't been possible um, in in all of human history and, and and so people were were able to to connect with this character regardless of of you know what continent they're on and of course even in America itself you had at the time huge waves of of of, of immigration and people from different nationalities and cultures and backgrounds all sitting next to one another, unable, without a common language as such, but being able to share in that experience of, of cinema and, and, and appreciate Chaplin's um, Tramp character. And, and as such, you know, hundreds of millions of people were regularly watching Chaplin films on a week, uh, week, base, week by week basis. And I guess there is nothing really that kind of compares in, in the modern day uh, to that sort of level of kind of uh, of, of fame and, um, and, 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 and celebrity. Um, and similarly, I suppose, in the 1920s, initially we talk in the film, uh, we have a, a sequence about Chaplin's relationship with, um, with his second wife, Lita Gray, and, and the abuse that she suffered and, and the way that her, their story was presented in the press. And, and Lita says um, in, in, in an interview with her that, you know, many people didn't believe her story, you know, because, because they were in love with, with that little, little man on the screen. They couldn't untangle Chaplin, the, the individual, and, and, and Chaplin, the tramp character. And then, so there's no doubt that, that Chaplin was able to, in a way, kind of hide behind that celebrity which of course has uh, a great kind of contemporary resonance with with some of the um the ripples that have been going through hollywood in in recent years of course but i think i think he was he, he was fortunate as you say to have existed for him certainly uh, in that period where where he was able to uh, to, uh, to to take that protection and and I and I, I just can't see that there's any one individual when you look out there across culture that that quite comes close to that sort of wattage of of, of star power that Chapton had and and maintained for you know decades the first four decades of uh, of the twentieth century. It, it it's just such a fascinating documentary of a person that that we all think that we knew um, and and. And, or maybe we didn't know. And I think that that's one of the major accomplishments of the film. Gentlemen, um, congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions uh, for the Oscars, Golden Globes, SAG Awards, Critics' Choice, and stay tuned uh, for interviews with more contenders throughout the season. James Spinney, Peter Middleton, uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs>